Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. We work for fur, nothing will go anywhere, we crawl, we put our bodies through so much, we put our minds and our psyches and everything, because we're offering up us. Welcome, listeners, to another special episode of In the Envelope. Isn't every episode of this podcast special, uh, but today's feels extra, extra special. I think we said last week that Reese Witherspoon was our 200th guest interviewed, which is true, but today's guest is our 200th guest aired. (laughs) So I'm just going to capitalize on this uh, milestone of booking 200 guests on this podcast. Anyway, our guest needs no introduction. Her name is Nicole Kidman. This is another blockbuster episode Um, Producer Jamie Muffet called it that, and I think that is absolutely true. I'm so excited for you all to hear it. Uh, But the main thing that I need to address with you all today, listeners, is that SAG Awards voting is underway, which means, of course, if you are a member of the SAG After Union and in good standing, as in you've paid your union dues and are a working actor or artist, you are responsible or you are honored with the responsibility of voting for the top film and TV performances of 2021. I just wanted to say among those nominees, I wanted to give a shout out. And also, hey, if you are a voter and you're looking for more insight that might inform your decision about who to vote for, or you just want to hear firsthand craft and career advice from such stars, check out our podcast episodes with the following SAG nominees. There's a lot of them, so get ready. Okay, Brett Goldstein, Jessica Chastain and Oscar Isaac, Katrina Balfe, Ruth Nega, Michael Keaton, one of my favorites, Jared Leto, Melanie Linsky, of course, Reese Witherspoon, and today's guest, the phenomenon known as Nicole Kidman. She is nominated this year for both SAG and Oscars and a bunch of other awards for playing Lucille Ball and actually, fascinatingly, to hear about in this interview, for playing Lucille Ball and essentially for playing Lucy Ricardo. They were essentially two different roles. If you've seen the movie, you know what I mean. If you haven't, go see the movie. It's Aaron Sorkin's biopic, Being the Ricardos. And in order to do it, she had to approach it from the biopic's angle of recreating an iconic person, a very iconic person in this case. She has called it the hardest role she's ever done. And so getting to ask her about that was really, really excellent, really excellent insights here into her process and certainly into her career and navigating her career, her philosophy as an actor, as an artist, as somebody who has endured in the industry for a very long time. She's so prolific. I'm about to record a bio intro for her that I had to cut so many of her pro- her notable projects. We can't fit them all into this episode. Anyway, SAG Awards themselves take place February 27th. Uh, voters have until this Friday, the 25th, to vote. So get to it. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's hear from today's sponsor and get to this amazing Nicole Kidman interview, which was recorded just after she learned of her Oscar nomination. And thank you, as always, for listening. Head over to Backstage.com for all kinds of exclusive, amazing content on a lot of the SAG Award nominees beyond just the podcast episodes I mentioned. And yeah, keep tuning in for more In the Envelope. Let's get to it. Amazon Studios presents Being the Ricardos from writer-director Aaron Sorkin, now nominated for three Academy Awards for Best Actress Nicole Kidman, actor Javier Bardem, and supporting actor J.K. Simmons. Also nominated for two SAG Awards, Best Actress Nicole Kidman and Actor Javier Bardem, and three Critics' Choice Awards, including Best Supporting Actor J.K. Simmons. Deadline calls it one of the best films of the year. Being the Ricardos is streaming now on Prime Video. (laughs) 
Nicole Kidman has earned Emmy, BAFTA, and Academy Award nominations and wins for decades of riveting work on stage and screen, from Australia to the US. She's starred in To Die For, Eyes Wide Shut, Moulin Rouge, The Hours, Cold Mountain, Rabbit Hole, Lion, Destroyer, and on TV, Big Little Lies, The Undoing, and Nine Perfect Strangers, much of which she has also served as producer. She's now Oscar and SAG Award nominated for her work as Lucille Ball in Aaron Sorkin's Being the Ricardos, and will next star in Robert Eggers' The Northman. Here is the legendary Nicole Kidman. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us. Glad to be here backstage. You know backstage. Oh, backstage, yeah. <laughs> I love being backstage. <laughs> well, on behalf Thank of backstage, you. congratulations on your Oscar nomination. I'm so, so pleased about it. Amazing. Like, I, <laughs> I am beyond pleased. And, and it's happening in the midst of all of your whirlwind travel, you were saying. Yeah, we were jet lagged. <laughs> and thus, I actually didn't know the um, nominations were being announced the Tuesday morning yeah. on the 8th. I thought it was the 9th. Oh. So, because in Australia, it is the 9th. Oh, right. Um, so, we traveled back, and that's why I was confused. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was meant to be. It was a. I'm. Right. I'm. Was just. You know. I got a. An amazing um, breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. yeah congratulations. Yeah. It's very well deserved. Yeah. And I just love. Jk and Javier and. Yes. Um, obviously, I've. I, I said I've uh, Nina and Tony and Alia. Every single Jack. Everyone who's in the. It from every little person in this, we were all oh, yeah. in it together. It's very well deserved because I, I mean, I love this movie. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thanks so much. Um, so obviously you know backstage, but I got to just start mm. from the beginning. I mean, why mm. acting? You've done this. You've known from a very young age. This, this is what you wanted to do. This is what you were meant to do. Correct. Yeah, I think it was my desire. Whether I, whether it's um, I because I was from um, you know, Australia. You go. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, this is going to be my career. It was almost like you got to have some other other choices, yeah. and you've got to have a plan. And that's kind of a dream. That's not a real. That's not a realistic career in um, when I was growing up. And in the Australian film industry, there just wasn't the employment to warrant um, mm. saying this is what I'm going to do. But I think I just I started reading. I started, you know, imagining I would. It was my place that I could go for solace and and absorbing characters and emotions and and that happened. I can't even remember mm. when that started. But that's so interesting that that's so young because, of course, you've talked about those emotions and working through mm -hmm. your own issues through characters. It sounds like <laughs> it sounds like instinctively that's what you wanted to do as a child. I think my empathy was just built from a very very early age so therefore my ability to jump into the minds imaginations um ideas emotions um i would lie in bed in the dark at night as a child and picture things i was fascinated with dreaming um as well and i would try to enter my i would try to sort of begin my dream and end my dream like i would start with a story oh, cool. in terms of my head and because I'd be like, I came up with that thing very early on that, you know, we spend so much of our time sleeping. Gosh, why don't I live the life I want to live in my dream at night? Very cool. And so that became, I, I think that was just my imagination and my desire to move into other worlds and other places and other people's psyches at that early, early age. And, and partly I do always credit it um, literature because I grew up with books yeah, and I have very fair skin and my mother um, would sit me in my bedroom when everyone else was out playing sports and on the beach and, mm -hmm. you know, there's very, very strong sun in Australia and I was put inside during the day for a lot of the day. So books were my solace, were my protection and were my escape. 
And thus came the ability to go, oh, this can actually, I could create these characters. Yeah. It's funny I didn't choose to write because I just didn't. I chose sure. to enact them, you know, to be it. Yeah, imagination. But I do remember yeah. I would yearn, pine, be, feel. I mean, those books were so profound to me and and the emotions that, the greatest writers in the world write about and primarily I would I had a reading well you know that 100 books you're meant to read in your life that kind of thing yeah and I was ticking books off the list <laughs> <laughs> but I was really into the Russians you know Dostoevsky and Tolst- Tolstoy for some reason they spoke in the deepest possible way to me very early on mm-hmm and you've mentioned Chekhov of course well then I moved into Chekhov because mm-hmm. when I was um I my parents who were both academics and are not in the arts and take us to opera and everything but they and to to see theater and to go to galleries and but we were never um it wasn't like oh my gosh I grew up around actors or anything like that so I grew up around scientists and a nurse and um yeah and so which explains empathy though because my father Mm. ultimately became a psychologist as well and yeah. therefore there was an enormous amount of discussion of people and social consciousness and hmm. the idea of people um, navigating sure. their lives, you know, with all of the damage and trauma and joy and just everything. So that was a big part of what I was. But in terms of finding, I think, the career of it and going, yeah. gee, they found me a drama school on the Saturday morning, that was a godsend for me. A mm. godsend, yeah. Which is so crucial. Mm-hmm. And I, it's so interesting to see, like, of what you just said, so much of that has endured, I would say, today. You've played so many different roles. We always ask, are there things that you do every time? But I feel like in this case, it's more like, which of what you just said is still a part of your artistic philosophy or still something that you're bringing to every character? Of course, empathy, imagination. Just go for it, like jump in, try, you know, the, the, the abandonment of that young mind, Ah. don't let that older experience of life take that away. That would be the thing that I carry. And I have no idea why I still get the goosebumps. I get the um, adrenaline. I get the nervousness. I get the elation. Hmm. I get the waiting for uh, the call or waiting for the news. As I've always said this, as actors, we can't be control freaks. We're not able to. Yes. We have. We are constantly in the position of being considered for a role. <laughs> so someone else gets to really contribute to our destiny. Other people do, and they determine a, a lot of it, and that is just the nature of what we do. Unless we become writers and directors and actors and we can, you know, forge a path for ourselves, so much of it is going, are you going to give me this chance, please? And that is still such a huge part of who I am. I, I have never lost that thing where you go oh, oh my gosh and that was absolutely with Lucille Ball it's it came my way and I was shocked that it came my way mm. and when I was sort of talking to Aaron about it and I was like I couldn't believe when he said well I'd like you to do it it was that still the exact same feeling of going oh Oh my gosh, I got the role. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. it's completely present and real for me. And that never wanes. That's I so think cool. When it does, I will move out of this this career path. Right. <laughs> and it's not even a career. When when I use the word career, it sounds like a business. And I think uh, any actor would say, no, no, this is not that. Yeah. I mean, we work for, for nothing. We'll go anywhere. We crawl. We put our bodies through so much. We put our minds and our psyches and everything because we're offering up us. Yeah. You know, we're offering it up for consumption, for criticism, sure. for love, and to be molded, used, 
um, hopefully not abused, yeah. um, dealt with sacred care. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm deeply committed to the craft of this and it's why I always love to talk about it with actors. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly emotional to me. Oh, I think that's great. That's There's so much great advice that you've just given. And one is don't be embarrassed about being nerdy or obsessive about the craft, right? Like that's a great one. <laughs> Own well, being it. an actor, you know, yeah. it's something to hold with care and reverence that, that the, my mother would say when for someone to find what they want to do and to love what they want to do, so many people in this world don't, don't get given that. Absolutely. Mm. We have a passion. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I feel very, um, I'm, I'm in a very, very safe place with actors and then with directors and writers and around my people. You know? Yeah. Nice yeah. Well, time. I definitely want to ask about like the ideal collaborations between filmmakers or especially you as, as a producer, but first in terms of this idea of like, yeah, taking care of yourself and preserving <laughs> yourself, do you think about like a work life balance? Like I'd love to ask like what inspires you outside of the work that then inspires the work? Cause I think it's just such a great point you're saying about mm -hmm. the second that this doesn't become as exciting for you or as nervous for you is when and you should passionate. probably move I on. mean we're asking ourselves to live with an enormous amount of scrutiny and yes. um we're putting ourselves in other people's hands in a huge way yeah so often and so is that worth it yeah and that's the question that's what it's that's the ultimate yes it's still worth it yeah and that then that's not a career. That's not a, um, I see. That's a whole different place that you exist from. And I think any any actor, but anyone who has some artistic path and who has really devoted themselves to it and enjoys it, loves it, and sacrifices for it, understands though that. Absolutely. It's a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. sacrifice in regards to the people you love what you're asking them to go through, what you're asking yourself to go through. And, you know, that is a big, there's big questions, decisions, commitments, understanding required from everyone in that path. Yeah. And when you say sacrifice, you don't just mean sacrificing your time, your energy. No. You're talking about emotions. It's Probably deep. that's the, the least, I mean, time and all those things. And yeah. But it's about going... Mama's going to go now and Mama's going to go through this and I need you to know it doesn't diminish any of my love for you, mm. but this is deeply, deeply um, needed in my life and my creative path is 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 deep, but it doesn't diminish, diminish anything that I have for you. And the same with your partner, the same with, you know, your animals. <laughs> have to be away for, you know, everyone has to, it, I mean, that's a big thing. A lot of times as actors, we're going off to London or something. You can't bring your dog, <laughs> you sure, know, sure. you or you can't. I mean, those things, I know that sounds completely um, thing, but there's th those, those relationships, you know, we're, we're, we don't have a desk job. We don't have an office job. No. We don't have a nine to five job and we are, we travel the world yeah, and we give of our, the deepest part of our souls. <laughs> well, and I'm sure, have you ever tipped too far into the balance? Like as if we think of it as a work-life balance, of course, you've learned this the hard way, right? Like Always. giving yourself too I much even to the say, job. I would say now I've learned, I'm, I'm rigorous in what I say I can and can't do. Yes. I still totally um, just, you know, slip fall off the wagon because <laughs> you love it <laughs> and then yeah and then I have to rebalance and I think that is for me really important that it's you mm -hmm. know constantly it's an exploration it's a journey and yeah and the other thing I'll always say is this journey is it's an up and down one you're not going to get a consistent mm -hmm. it's always going to be like that sure so 
it's just funny for somebody as prolific as you, it to, to outsiders, it seems like, oh, she's just working all the time and she has everything figured out and under control. And that's not always the case. <laughs> Um, no, it is constant trial and error, trial and error. an enormous amount of mistakes made, but yeah. it's all done from, you know, this place of really going, I just want to, I want to do good work. I want to be around people I enjoy. I'm, I want to have a very, very full, rich, deep life by the end of it. Yeah. And the expectation from myself to deliver, you know, when you're, I mean, there's days when you go in and you go, there's nothing, I've got nothing happening and having to just relax into that and then suddenly magic happens. That's what I always say with take the, the mind is so tricky with with our craft. It's really important analytic, analytically to be able to analyze text and da, da, da. and then we've got to be visceral. So we're constantly doing this swing between intellectual and Mm. visceral, and it has to be facile. Yeah. And again, trial and error, that's achieved through trial and error. Yeah. And it's never going to be, oh, I got this now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I got it. (laughs) No. 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 Completely unrealistic. And I love talking about it because – I went to um, the drama school when I was young, but I'm, I'm not in a drama school. I'm not talking about but I'm here willing to pass things on and share and learn, yeah. and I'm learning. I'm still learning. Totally. So, yeah, I can, I can offer some advice, wisdom, whatever, but at the same time I'm like, help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that, that. that is it. So it's, it's a, such a growth um, journey as an actor. Or it should be viewed that way, for sure. Yeah. And everything yeah. you've just said is such great, like, early career advice. Like, is is some of the advice to, for those at the beginning of their career, to, as you say, like, talk about it, to define maybe their artistic mission, their artistic philosophy, if not a career it path. Ebbs. It can change. Yeah. It ebbs, it flows. Mm-hmm. It en- ends up over here. I mean, part of spontaneity is like oh my god I ended up over oh yikes what am I doing here okay now I'm in a 12-week run I'm not sure how I even made this you know and now I'm over oh gosh that didn't I so wanted that what happened um and mm, but then I wouldn't been able to go here and I wouldn't been able to do that and I wouldn't and that's also including life I would have missed out on this life experience which Mm. was something else for me i didn't know you know this was around the corner Mm. so i think there's an abandonment that's sort of required as well yes that's what you mean by really going for it but yeah i think there's an enormous amount of just going if my if i stay pure in what i'm what i love and if i stay pure artistically yeah. Um, then I will find my way. Yeah. And that will that will be enough. Sure. Gosh, that's <laughs> you've got me on a very philosophical morning. Amazon Studios presents Being the Ricardos from writer-director Aaron Sorkin, now nominated for three Academy Awards for Best Actress Nicole Kidman, actor Javier Bardem, and supporting actor J.K. Simmons. Also nominated for two SAG Awards, Best Actress Nicole Kidman and actor Javier Bardem, and three Critics' Choice Awards, including Best Supporting Actor J.K. Simmons. Deadline calls it one of the best films of the year. Being the Ricardos is streaming now on Prime Video. So much of what you just said must factor into the actual character building craft and process mm. and going for it and the trial and error and the making mistakes and the, fear. and the fear and the nerves. It's so cool that your, you know, your heart was pounding when you were offered this part. Like talk to me about the Lucille. Excitement, because that was the, that was the, oh my gosh, you get the chance <laughs> to be in an Aaron Sorkin film directed by him with these actors. Mm. And this is like, what? This doesn't happen at this age. And <laughs> sure. um, and then the opposite of that, a weekend going, oh, God, I this isn't, 
whoa, I didn't quite realize yeah. her accent, her voice, her this or that. I didn't realize what I was taking on. <laughs> and I had the most gorgeous dialect coach who just was like, you're going to be fine. And mm. just walked me through it sound by sound, step by step over Zoom. I had, oh. I just, I just worked on her vocally, which is very unusual for me. Okay. Um, and then moved into her emotionally. Gotcha. Okay. See, that's that's sort of one of the questions I always ask is outside in versus inside out. And accent work seems to me like, I guess that counts as outside in, that counts as physicalization. At her movements and study, and because it's two roles, there was the Lucy, the Lucy Ricardo yes. and the Lucy Ball. And the, the differences in the tone of the voice, the differences in the mannerisms, the differences in one is a performance and one is a real woman uh, and all of those things and that's when i went oh my gosh this is <laughs> this is rich and difficult yeah. and extraordinary and then you're also dealing with the soul context where it's like very very particular and rapid yes. and um you know luckily i'd done a play photograph 51 a couple of years prior which was a lot of scientific jargon I've done it on the West End, and that was really, really, that was hard for me. It was really hard. It was incredibly um, gratifying in the end, but it was a lot, and there was a lot of scientific jargon with that, mm -hmm. and, you know, the cues and having to really. Oh, yeah. So that had given me the um, the sort of the muscle and the, and the ability to go <sighs> hunker down and learn this and then be able to out, you know, so I'd, I'd sort of almost worked that muscle of yeah. back and forth, back and forth, learning text, but also um, still keeping a looseness and a humanity and then mm. learning it. So just that, the, co the collision of those two things. Yeah, I mean, this, this all explains why you've said this was the hardest role you've ever yeah. taken on. And yeah. what's exciting to me is this idea of like, part I didn't of that realize week, it was going to be. <laughs> that's the thing. <laughs> And it sounds like part of it was realizing that you had to create two characters. Is it safe to say that you were you had to deliver two performances? And that she's iconic. And she's probably the most iconic person, real person you've played. Yeah. You so played real I, people I, before. I was right? like, how did I not realize this? <laughs> <laughs> so, but what goes into that research? I mean, of course, you mentioned the voice, getting her, her voice correct. But there's so yeah. much documentation of her. Yeah. And there's fantastic footage of her standing, you know, going put the camera there and da, 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 move here and what what but we did this last you know I remember last year being doing this why can't you do that and da, da, da. and really those things and how she was dressed and her movements and her she was so grounded when mm -hmm. she did that and she was so solid and so direct I mean really razor sharp smart yeah. and very direct Lucille Ball, I'm talking about. Oh yeah, not and, Lucy Ricardo. And we all know Lucy Ricardo, and we I'm not as familiar with the that person you just yeah. described of Lucille Ball. So, yeah. is one more of an invention, and one is more of a recreation, perhaps? What does that mean? As in, for uh, Lucy Ricardo, you are recreating scenes, which I of, of course involves yeah. invention as well, but creating Lucille Ball, yeah. especially in the Aaron Sorkin dialogue involves creating yeah, a character I mean, as if from scratch. The creation of the Lucy Ricardo was interesting because, yeah, you can do this, but if you mm -hmm. don't have, she had life behind her eyes. Uh -huh. So when she was doing that, there was a whole inner life to her. So that's why it's not mimicking her. No. It's actually going into her being Lucy Ricardo. So the layers mm -hmm. of those, because, yeah, I could do the movements like choreography, mm -hmm. but where's the life? Mm -hmm. where's the because her eyes sparkle her there's a reason that's going on in there yes ah. um it's not robotic it's very very alive and that's where it becomes layer upon layer upon layer so you're finding the reasons behind this character i love that idea like that's part mm. of your process find the reasons find the why yeah and the life because otherwise it's like just a perfect mimicry of the Lucy Ricardo show. And, you know, we shot, I made sure that I was prepared so that, which is just probably, you know, what I've, what I've always tried to do is you're, 
prepared to shoot the whole scene. So what's in the film is far less than what we shot. Gotcha. I was like, oh, I wish there was more of the black and white footage in it. Um, oh, me too. The film would have been three hours. Um, but <laughs> we did those scenes and all the actors had learned to, and we did it like, and that took months to prepare. And it's, what is it, eight Barely. minutes in the film? Yeah. yeah. So, but those scenes, I wish they could, I wish there was the full grape scene because I did the full grape scene. Ah. No. Um, but that's that. That's what you do as an actor. You, you give it yep. and then the decisions are made. That's what I mean by not a control freak. You right. Know? That's but so you can't come in and go, they go, we're going to shoot the whole scene. You go, I didn't, I'm not, what? I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> right? You got to go, okay, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. Let's play. And then there's the element of play. Element of play. Element of play. Yeah. So where does your relationship with the text come in? And this is where I can ask about what is the ideal collaboration with an Aaron Sorkin? In this case, Aaron Sorkin. But of mm. course, I'd love to ask about Jane Campion or, or Kubrick or even um, Jean-Marc Vallée. Mm. Every single one of them is an individual and every single one of them has a different artistic approach mm -hmm. and every single one of them is magnificent. And I'm happy that I've been chosen to be in their, in their creative um, path because that was them choosing me. Sure. Well, you've said before this interesting thing about like you're channeling a character's psyche, but you're also channeling a director's psyche. And well, I'm the wondering... The director, I think, is... The director is like looking at you going, what is here that they as as we all view the world differently they view you differently so every single one of them so going to be everything every relationship with them is unique so mm -hmm. how they um interpret you view you what they want from you how they understand you how they connect with you every single one of them is different so there is that sense of you know, those those energies and those the way in which they come together mm. creates character and creates a world. Cool. Um, so they're all different because the way in which you respond to each of them is different too and what they're desiring of you and how they view you. They're just as all our friendships in, our, in the world are different, yes. just as all our love affairs are different, just as all everything's different. There's no carbon copies. And I think that's where I come. I come into the um, into the place, going, I'm here. Like, what are you thinking? You know, what are you feeling, and what do you want? And so many of them, particularly, is why I'm drawn to the auteurs because they have a very, very strong view of what they want. Then they will. Some of them will move and expand, or not. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be willing to have that happen as well. The control is not really yes. the actual place. We don't, you know, any anyone will tell you this on stage. Once you're on stage, there's probably more. But at the same time, you're still in the sets that have been designed, the mm. the, the place. You're, you're still, you know, but you do have two, three hours of, okay, now I have this. That that obviously is very different. So, right. And you're not in the editing room. Right. It's an interesting. Everyone forgets the editing process as well and editors yes. come into play here too and cinematographers come into play how they're viewing you and depending on how um cinematic a director is in terms of their understanding of camera and shots and light i mean there's they're all so magnificent and different where does your producer brain or do you think of it as a separate hat maybe just for yeah. the projects you're producing like does that factor into your building characters or these collaborations I mean, it was primarily built from a frustration of not having any sort of um, control over my destiny in a way and, Which I love. and having reached a stage where it was like, okay, there's nothing. Um, I'm not being asked to be in things that that I would, you know, say I'm going to leave my family and I'm going to do this right now. And I'm, I'd moved to Nashville and I was in a place where we could live, we were living on a farm and um, I got pregnant and I went and my husband was working. So I was very fortunate that I could go, well, then this is probably now what I'm going to do. And 
my mom was like, I think you need a creative outlet. And I'm like, oh, cool. I've got a vegetable garden. I'm going to do that. And she was like, I feel like you shouldn't move away from what you've spent your life doing right uh, now. I think keep your tone. And I read a review of Rabbit Hole. <laughs> and I went, wow. And this is where I'm so bonkers. So I'm pregnant. <laughs> and I'm choosing to do rabbit hole <laughs> uh, in terms of producing. Like, what is that about? And I think that's I've, I've when I look at it, I go so going into your biggest fear. Sure. Um, and talk about nerves. That that was not a conscious sort of decision. I was just like, what an extraordinary piece of writing. Hmm. Um, and David Lindsay Bear was just lovely. And I was like, wouldn't this be fantastic if we could produce this and bring it to the screen? And then it was the, the um, thing of trying to get some financing for that sort of storytelling, which was like, people were like, so well written, but I really do not think this can be a film. And that was just sheer sort of belief and just mm -hmm. kind of scrappy, raising whatever we could for a budget to be able to make that film. Mm -hmm. Um, and Pear Sari, who's my producing partner, was like just, you know, so passionate as well. And we were able to raise a very, very small budget and, and we made it, you know, on a shoestring. Yeah. So it is another wow. creative outlet and it is another way of you expressing yourself artistically that sounds like doesn't and overlap. Supporting things that weren't going to have their path, probably just because right. it was like, well, Business-wise, this seems like a terrible decision because you're going to make a film about a marriage um, surviving the death of a child. Yeah. Um, that is not going to be breaking box office records, hmm. you know. So, and I remember being at the Toronto Film Festival and the audience clapped at the end hmm. And we got some good re good reviews and suddenly we were able to sell the film and it was just like <sighs> <laughs> yeah incredible incredible and it goes back to the acting of, i mean the advice for actors or artists like first of all the fact that the impulse was to find another creative outlet like i think that's another way for actors to take control of their career path mm. is to step behind the camera in that way but i love that you're also saying like it's about what stories you want to be told or what stories should be told. If you have the means to make them happen, do it. Mm, absolutely. And we can always come up with reasons why not to do it and uh. why it's going to be too hard. And I think that's, you know, there's always reasons to not do something. No, sure. never be able to do it. No, no, no. And how many stories do you hear where it was just like against all odds? So, yeah, again, again, like swing big, go all in. <laughs> Yeah, and you're one out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I think it's important for artists to know, like there's 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 not just gonna be success all the time. You got to be realistic. Oh. Yeah. Um, what is what is success ultimately? And that's for everyone so to decide. That's what I think. It's hmm. there's there's it's this. It's a it's a roller coaster, but it's a very curvy path hmm. as well. Love it. So. Love it. You've just summed up the whole life of an artist and, and made it <laughs> very palatable and very digestible. Still on it. <laughs> so great. O onward. <laughs> onward. Thank you so much, yeah. Nicole. This has been so great. Can I ask you one last like actorly question? Please. What is something you've seen recently? Maybe of uh, we always ask like, what is one performance you think every actor should see and study? But is there something re recently you've seen or anything that's particularly inspired you or on your mind i don't have one i mean i'm a i'm, I'm <laughs> we need another 45 minutes I'm, I'm a cinephile i love storytelling i love film i love the art so to ask me to say one is <laughs> like torturous to me i'm in awe of the talent that's out there but i'm also in awe of the talent that hasn't been found yet <laughs> so i always am like i cannot believe this person is out there sitting on this amount of talent and now they're going to get a chance and i've got friends where that is they've been the recipients of that so that is really an important thing to tell actors yeah you never know when it's going to happen yeah yeah 
I love it. I also just love an emerging theme here is like, stay in touch with your inner child and the reason that you were excited about this in the first place. It guides your artistic impulses, right? Play. Let's go play together. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Nicole, thank you so much. And congratulations on all of the awards. Attention thank for this you. Amazing role. Thank you. And to all of the people reading this, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. This is so mm-hmm. not taken for granted. Not one moment of it. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.